Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another night of Northshire Live. For those of you who don't know me, I am Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. It's lovely to see so many familiar friends here tonight and some new ones. Um, a couple of quick notes before we get started. First of all, you may notice that this meeting is being recorded. Um, however, fear not, we have the settings arranged so that it is only picking up to record those of us who are unmuted and speaking inside the yellow box. So as long as you stay muted, you will not be part of the recording and you will not show up on our YouTube channel. Um, so don't worry about that. You are welcome to have your video on if you would like to see everyone and be seen. Um, in light of that, please use the chat box throughout the evening to post any questions that you might have. Um, I will store them up and I will pose audience questions for you at the end of the night, but you can use that at any point. Um, and then last of all, before I introduce our guest authors this evening, a word of thanks. Um, it has been a long and difficult year for small businesses of all kinds and uh, in my world for independent bookstores. Um, Northshire has made it through so far and that is really thanks to the incredible support and loyalty of our customers. Um, meaning you. We couldn't do this without you. We couldn't have events like this without you. And we are deeply grateful for the support. Um, now that gets through the boring stuff. Now I am so very pleased to be able to welcome Martha Cooley to Northshire Live tonight to celebrate the release of her novel, By Me Love. Her previous novels are The Archivist and 33 Swoons, and she's also the author of the memoir, Guesswork. She directs the Delphi's MFA in creative writing and taught previously at the Bennington Writing Workshop, writing seminars, sorry. Tonight, she'll be interviewed by Lynn Sharon Schwartz, who has written more than 20 books and has been a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award and the National Book Award. Her most recent book is Truth Telling, Stories, Tables, and Glimpses. I'll put links to both books into the chat in just a moment. Please join me in welcoming them both at North, the North Star Live. Well, I guess I can begin if you all hear me. Can you all hear me? Good. I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I'm very happy to be here, and especially happy to be here with Martha, who is my colleague at the Bennington Writing Seminars for um, maybe 15 years. So <laughs> we got to know each other and our, our work. I am privileged to have read all of her books, the three novels and also the memoir. Uh, so it's been a pleasure. It's all, reading it all has been a pleasure, and especially this latest one. So I just, well, I'll just say a couple of words about uh, by me love, uh, I, I was uh, hesitant about telling you what the, the, the one of the central issues is, which is that a woman discovers that she has a winning lottery ticket because you don't like to give away, you know, be a spoiler. But when I looked at the book itself, it says it, it says it in about three places. So I guess I'm, I'm not revealing anything. Uh, although I will talk about it, ask a couple questions about it later. Um, so the, she wins a ticket for an enormous amount of money, not enough to change not only your life, but maybe your entire identity, which is something that certainly preoccupies her. But in addition to that, Buy Me Love has so many aspects and so many virtues, it's hard to know where to begin. But I will just say, besides the lottery ticket issue, it's also a mystery novel, it's a love story, it's a philosophical inquiry, and it also has social commentary. In other words, it's a, a rich tapestry and there are so many interweavings. I hope we get to talk about some of them. Gorgeous interweavings of plot, character and history. So, uh, and I should say that it's set, it's set in the Brooklyn, contemporary Brooklyn, which I ask later, Martha seems to know extremely well. It's not the Brooklyn that I grew up in, but it's a different Brooklyn. Uh, so before we talk about it, though, Martha, would you like to read us a brief excerpt? I would be happy to. But before I do that, I want to thank Rachel and Northshire, wonderful Northshire, both in Manchester and in Saratoga. Thank you so much for having me. And dear Lynn, for being my interlocutor tonight, my beloved colleague and mentor and friend. So this is just delightful for me. It's a wonderful combination of Bennington stuff and and Manchester and Saratoga stuff. Um, yes, Buy Me Love is set in 2005. So um, I'll read you a brief section. And th the novel has two protagonists. Um, 
One is the woman who wins the lottery ticket and the other is a young street artist, a woman who does street art about whom I'm sure we will talk a bit anon. Um, but this is the scene, as, as Lynn mentioned, what sort of gets things going here is this woman um, betting seven numbers that happen to be her childhood phone number on a lottery ticket. And, and this is not something she intended to do when it happens. So here's the scene in which, in which this occurs. It is set um, in Brooklyn, as Lynn said, in Park Slope actually is where this particular moment happens in 2005. Jaywalking across Sixth Avenue, Ellen opened the bodega's brass handled door. Ah, that scent with an overlay of freshest coffee. The proprietor, a short, oval-faced man, raised both hands in greeting. The dog by the register raised its head for a moment, then dropped back to sleep. Morning, the proprietor said in a gruff, cheerful voice. Morning, Mr. Reyes. He gestured in the direction of the avenue she had just crossed. A car sat in the middle of the intersection waiting to turn. Immediately behind it, a beat up black Lincoln honked aggressively. Car services, idiots, those drivers. Why can't Brooklyn have regular taxis like in the city? The Lincoln's driver leaned out of his window and began yelling at the driver ahead of him. Mr. Reyes clucked his tongue. One of these days, he said, you're gonna walk against that light and get mowed down. Those guys can't drive to save their own lives. Oh, I'll be fine, but thanks for worrying about me. Your usual? He reached for the coffee pot. Please, and one of those cookies your wife makes, they're so good. I haven't put them out yet. First, have some of this. He handed her a paper cup filled to its brim. She sipped cautiously, hot, strong, reassuring. She fished a $10 bill from her pocket and handed it over. Anything smaller, asked Mr. Reyes. Oh, sorry, hang on a sec. Reaching into her bag, she pulled out her wallet, attempting to open it with one hand while stabilizing her coffee with the other. Put that cup down, said Mr. Reyes. You're gonna spill all over yourself. Setting the cup on the counter, she spread open her billfold and walked the tip of her forefinger through its contents. No singles, just larger bills. No dice, I just went to the bank last night. All I've got are 20s. Rich lady, eh? Mr. Reyes chuckled. I wish. You could be. What, rich? Yeah, you should play this new lottery game. Win big time, really big. Like what? Like a hundred million, he smiled. That's the jackpot. She sipped more coffee. But I never play. I mean, I, I've never even bought a lottery ticket. Too complicated, all those rules. Complicated? Nah, it's easy. You just pick seven numbers, see? The printed form he handed her had seven empty squares in the middle. Tiny text swarmed across the white spaces above and below the squares. Squinting, she reached into her bag in search of her reading glasses. Mr. Reyes pointed to something like a cash register sitting on the counter near the dog, a modest white box with a small keyboard. Don't bother reading anything on that form, he said. It's all automated. All you got to do is pay your dollar and pick your numbers. They can be single or double digits. It doesn't matter. I'll punch them into that little machine and you check your TV tomorrow to see if you're the winner. I don't own a TV. Really? His brows rose. You don't get bored? I do get bored. That's why I don't own a TV. He laughed. Ah, uh, well, I can't make it through a day without watching a little soccer. Plus the news, you know, if something should happen. If something should happen, I've got a radio, so I'd know. Yeah, sometimes I wonder why we need to see everything. Who wants to watch buildings fall down over and over? Exactly. Or car bombings, suicide attacks. We've got ourselves into quite the mess over there, haven't we, Mr. Reyes? Hard to believe we've been at war over two years already. Ayudanos, listen, you really should try the new lottery. It's called Pick Seven. These crazy times we live in, I just have this feeling one of my customers is gonna win big. I'll even say a prayer for you. She laughed. Who will you pray to, Mr. Reyes? A divine figure, of course, 
Jesus, Mohammed, Buddha, I rotate them each week. Today's Monday. I have to check my calendar. You rotate them? Really? He nodded earnestly. To increase the odds, he said, look, buy a ticket and bring in your numbers tomorrow. That's when the drawing is. I'll tell you if you're a winner. Even if you don't hit the jackpot, they're giving out lots of smaller prizes. Wouldn't you like a few extra grand in your bank account or a trip to Barbados with your boyfriend? He smirked in a friendly, non-lascivious way. Ha, she said, right, my boyfriend, Casper the Friendly Ghost. Ah, well, escaping to Barbados by yourself wouldn't be so bad, would it? The coffee had cooled to just the right temperature, a reprieve, a few instants in the seat of happiness. The lottery form, seven empty boxes waiting to be filled in. You'll get a cut if I win, right? You bet, Mr. Reyes's smile elongated, revealing a pair of gold-capped incisors. All right, then, here's a buck. Pray to whomever you like. I'll take whatever help I can get. He grinned, gold teeth glinting. You'll get it. Oh, your cookie, wait, I almost forgot. I wouldn't let that happen. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm, I'm clapping. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Martha. That that was a wonderful passage to choose. And before I go on, I want the you know that you notice that uh, Martha mentions the disasters that happen so often, or that seem to be happened in the last few decades, maybe all, in all time. And there, it's funny that she gets them in there because there are so there are a number of disasters in this novel referred to. One of which is the um, the bombing uh, in Madrid, the Tokyo Station. Which, um, I'm sorry, I just lost you all for a minute. Uh, in which one of the a character or the fiance of one character is killed. But just like everything else in the novel, anything that comes up is sure to reappear again, like the threads in the tapestry. Um, so uh, another thing, Martha, let me ask you this: this passage you read, I think it occurs about uh, about a quarter of the way into the novel. And then when uh, Car uh, Ellen, when Ellen, the main character who's been speaking, finds out that she's the winner, it's about halfway into the novel. So considering that um, this is such an important part of the novel, how did you work it out to, why did you space them, those events, the way you did? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I, I wanted to create a sense of pressure to put, put these characters, all my characters under a kind of pressure. And there's a sort of tick-tock, tick-tock going on in the book in that um, we meet this woman, we begin to see what some of her concerns and preoccupations are in her own life. And she's, she's kind of stuck. She's a poet who isn't writing. She's in her 50s. She's, uh, she lives alone. Uh, well, she lives with two cats. Um, but she's, she's, um, all she's by the time this scene happens, we've already begun to see that some things are not um, going in her life the way she might have wanted or thought they might. Mm -hmm. um, and then she buys this ticket in a very sort of haphazard manner. And it is about, it is near halfway through when she finds out that she is the owner of a one hundred million dollar winning jackpot. Um, ticket. Now, what I didn't want is a novel in which she then hands it in and then we see her buy this or that or the other. That would have been remarkably tedious. I wanted to see what would happen when she realized, okay, I have X number of days, I have 30 days to turn this ticket in. And how am I going to prepare for what I know will be an utterly, preposterously, overwhelmingly life-changing event? So I was interested in, in the sort of rearrangement of the mental and emotional furniture, so to speak, that would necessarily start to happen as this woman contended with this event before it actually befell her, if you will. I mean, it's a strange phenomenon, I would imagine, not having won the lottery, um, to, to be in possession of this thing that will only happen when you make it happen. So part of what she does actually is sort of exercise a kind of control by refusing to accelerate the process in, in a way that she feels would be needless or actually not 
not good for her. So there's a kind of delay and the reader must experience that with her as well. But the reader knows tick tock, tick tock, we only have a certain amount of time, you know. And that delay creates a lot of suspense. I mean, I kept worrying all the way through and then 150 pages. When are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? And I was afraid, you know, maybe something would happen if you wouldn't do it. But that's, it keeps the novel, it keeps you on your toes at all times. Now, you mentioned Ellen is this character, this main character. And you mentioned uh, the other woman character, whose name is Blair. She's much younger. I think she's about 24. And she's a, some kind of artist. I don't know you can tell us what kind of artist she is. Uh, these characters... Uh, never actually meet. Uh, Ellen is more significant. Uh, Blair appears sporadically doing her crazy art, which uh, Martha can tell us about. Uh, she's a denizen of the New York subway. So if you ever see some strange art in the subway, you know that's where it came from. So they are like parallel lines, which you know never meet. And then sometimes, maybe they do in some alternate universe. So could you tell us a little about um, who they are, first, you know, their backgrounds, because there are some, some, there are many differences, but there are also some similarities in their backgrounds. Yeah, well, Ellen, as I said, is is a writer, a poet, um, and but a poet struggling with that part of her identity, a poet who reads poetry all the time, but um, is not feeling secure in the making of it. And Blair is the street artist who who relishes. Um, art that occurs on the street that's sort of improvisational and also ephemeral that sort of happens by chance. And Blair comes from a very disturbed family. Um, and one of the things that unites these characters though they, they do not encounter one another is, is the fact that they each have a very troubled brother. And Ellen's brother lost his fiance in the Madrid bombing. And he's a composer and an alcoholic, a very gifted person who has ceased composing through notation, but now composes by drawing. And so there's a kind of a, a thing going on in this book around art forms and kind of cro weird crossings over um, where, you know, when the brother is a composer who draws and we have this, this street artist who is on the street making her art on the street and this poet. Um, so the visual and the, the, the oral and the written all show up as modes in this book of, of sort of the imagination and of, of being. Um, the brother of Blair, the troubled street artist has gone missing and, um, her relationship with him is, is, a, is a disturbed and disturbing one. I won't say anything more about it than that. Um, but her way of proceeding in the world is to sort of lean on the philosophy of Albert Camus, um, toward whom she has a sort of magpie approach. She sort of picks and chooses parts of Camus that appeal to her. She's not a Camus scholar and God knows neither am I. I, I wanted her to be someone who needed Camus and needed his particular brand of existentialism for her own purposes and who therefore, whose reading of him therefore is rather skewed, shall we say. Um, and so she leans on Camus and she has this notion of making art that will derange mental orbits as she puts it. Um, so it's, she's an agent provocateur who believes in invisibility, the artist as invisible. Ellen, on the other hand, has sort of become an invisible artist, if you will. And when the brother is, is frustrating to Ellen, who thinks that he wasn't in the least invisible, but if he continues notating by drawing, he might become so. So there's issues of ambition, of sort of artistic purpose and ambition that arise in the book and I didn't want to hammer on those. I wanted those to just sort of be reverberations, if you will, you know, things happening um, in the context of the story of what are these two characters who need, who need money, they each need money. Ellen doesn't have it. She's been freelancing her whole life and Blair doesn't have it um, being young and just starting out and not with an established career. So what are these two characters who need money going to do about it? And that, you know that that question of money putting pressure along with time putting pressure is both those things are pretty pretty essential to the book. 
Well, I'm glad you brought up the commune because um, it, it was, I've never seen this quite done quite like this. Example, Blair, I, I'd like to just insert, is not only, uh, she's not only young, but she, she's a dangerous character. She causes harm. Uh, she she uh, has encounters with some young people and has no qualms about being violent or aggressive. She, she scares me, uh, for one thing. But um, it's very interesting to have a character rely for a, sort of a philosophical or moral guide on someone whom we all respect. And, you know, come in, you can pick out quotes and say, I, you know, I, especially him, you know, I, I'm going to live by this. This is a good way to conduct my life. And she does pick out at random these quotes and uses them to conduct her life and is not, it, it, not, not, a, a good, not a good way. So that kind of uh, playing around, which I, I think you're doing, I, I enjoyed uh, very much. Now, uh, the, the, there are a lot of parallels and coincidences. I, Oscar Wilde said about, I can't remember about what, uh, that something is some work of art was crowded with incident, which is a, a statement we use in my family all the time. You know, how is, how is like such a party or dinner it was crowded with incident? So this, uh, this novel is crowded with coincidence. Uh, and usually when you say something's a coincidence in a novel, you say, you know, eh, that's, that's not good because, you know, it's too coincidental. Here, quite the contrary, the coincidences are wonderful. Martha makes them work for her. And they're, they're very, they're kind of subtle. They're just dropped in. You might not notice them. Uh, there are several car crashes, people lose loved ones. Other people who have the same name, or just to give you an example, her father, uh, Carol's father, uh, leaves his family. His name is Walter. He's a famous baritone to go to live with a, a gay man in Italy whose name is Bruno. So she remarks, "Oh, Bruno Walter, you know, conductor." There's a lot like that. So Martha, um, could you tell us a little about how you how you uh, came upon this uh, this idea of using so many coincidences, making them so satisfying instead of uh, you know getting people tired of them and wh what is it all about yeah you know I, I don't think I consciously set out to do that um, and yet at the same time I, I found myself frustrated by the sort of dictum that we you know have in writing workshops across the land oh too many coincidences is is tricksy it's it's gimmicky you know it's it's a sign of a of an amateur writer you know, oh, and he just happened to be there on the street at just the right moment with the knife and wasn't, you know, did it all work out perfectly that murder. And, you know, I, I wanted to, to find a way to recognize what I think is, is true for us all that's articulated by actually the, the, the character Bruno, the, the lover of Ellen's father, Walter, who says at one point, our, our lives are, are sprinkled with coincidences like salt. I mean, they're everywhere. You know, we, we, we actually, when we stop and notice it, all of our lives have coincidences in them. And we don't balk and say, how could that be? That's wrong. We, we laugh at them or smile at them or are startled by them or maybe even frightened by them, but we know them to be real. We know that they exist and they operate in our lives at, at, at minor banal levels and at, at more serious uh, levels as well. So they're a thing, they're real. And I wanted them to be in some ways the, the subject of this story. I mean, it's just pure coincidence that Mr. Reyes in the bodega happens to suggest buying a ticket to this woman. You know, if he'd been caught up with another customer, it, it, that whole transaction wouldn't have happened. And it's pure coincidence that the novel opens with Ellen seeing this piece of paper being wafted up by the air underneath, the, the subway runs under the street in on 9th Street in, in Park Slope and there are grates and stuff gets wafted up and sort of held up against the underside of a grate and she sees this piece of paper and it has these numbers scrawled on it and she goes, I know those numbers, that's my childhood phone number. And that may seem kind of, oh, come on. And yet I trusted somehow that this could be credible and readers have been telling me that it, that it is, so that's reassuring. But mainly I just feel like if you have one sort of 
one thing that sets it in motion and then the emotional activity is real and genuine, um, it's okay. You can then keep introducing subtly other coincidences without it sort of stopping the reader in their tracks. You don't want to you don't want to break what, you know, John Gardner used to call the fictional dream. You don't want the reader to be snapped out of that saying, wait, 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 you know, I see the pieces being moved on the board. So I was always trying to be really mindful of that problem, um, you know, to uh, avoid it, avoid a pile on, but to nonetheless pay attention to and, and respect to this phenomenon of coincidences in our lives. So. Um, you know, once once Ellen buys the ticket, the reader's attention does go more to when is she going to redeem it and what's going to happen. And I think when the coincidences occur, the reader is maybe distracted by the problem of the ticket and notices them in a different way than had that not had that tension not been there to kind of drive the action forward. It's when coincidences do all the work of driving the action forward that I think there's a problem when there's something else that galvanizes and, and, and uh, propels the story, then, then they can be there um, more effectively. That is, thank you. That is perfectly put because I, I was trying to answer that question for myself when I read the book and I did, I, th you said it, you said just what happens and it's true, they are all over. Even the coincidence of people's names being the same sometimes. Uh, there's a, a beautiful element relating to coincidence in the book and that frames it and it reminds us that even though it's you know, a totally realistic novel, uh, it begins as Martha just said with her uh, Ellen on the subway, there's a lot of subway travel, uh, Ellen noticing this piece of paper fluttering against a grate. And at the same time, she's, she's worried that she's lost her wallet, which it turns out she hasn't, she just can't find it in the mess in her uh, purse. And then at the very end, when you've pretty much forgotten that early thing, 250 pages earlier, uh, there's another piece of paper involved, or a similar piece of paper. And again, she's boring, or have I, have I lost my wallet? So I, that kind of frames the entire story. I think that's the, one of the most beautiful trick, not tricks, how can I deploy is it? One of the most beautiful aspects that you put into play there. Um, at the same time, we haven't talked much about it being a love story. Uh, at, there's so much going on here with money and with, 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 uh, Blair and the crazy art that uh, it's remarkable that Martha has managed to put in a convincing, very realistic, very tender, but not sentimental love story. And it starts out at, at the gym where uh, Ellen is very assiduous and working out. Do you want to tell us a bit about how she gets into that? Yeah, I mean, that that to me, that's like my own little inside joke. I used to live right across the street from the, the, the Y uh, on Ninth Street in Park Slope. Any of you who have been to Brooklyn and know Park Slope might know whereof I speak. Uh, and so uh, that gym is sort of dear to me and it has this peculiar sort of um, mezzanine track over the basketball court. And I just pictured um, the man she becomes drawn to as teaching um, tumbling and, and you know, tumbling activity to, to these kids in this gym. And that seemed really fun to me that it just to imagine him doing something so different from her, you know, being a very different sort of man. But, um, um, a man with a heart, uh, you know, I, I needed him to be a, of a certain kind of um, openness and capacity for tenderness. So developing him was, was a real pleasure and realizing that he, there's this boy in his life, which I don't wanna say too much to give away too much, um, but there is this, this boy, um, this uh, young boy whom Ellen also gets to know and the role this this child is is Italo American. Roy is the man, and and Ennio is the kid. And um, the way in which the boy figures in Ellen's emotional life um, was something that took some doing. It took several years to sort of understand and develop that part of the novel. But the the child ended up being very essential 
I think, to the journey that Ellen was on and to where she ends up at the very end of the novel. Um, so I, I needed a guy that she would, I, I knew she was a, a straight woman and that she would fall in love with, with a man if she was going to fall in love with anyone. But what I needed her also to be surprised by was sort of falling in love with a child as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, for that to be an unexpected dimension of her uh, journey toward a new kind of openness as a result of all this. And I just, I did, you know, picture the kind of stress and pressure that she would be put under meeting someone and becoming interested in him at the same time that she's in possession of a hundred million dollar lottery ticket. I mean, when do you drop that particular bomb in a new relationship, you know, and how does that play out? I mean, it's just that it introduces the, the obvious questions of trust and intimacy and secrecy. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a crazy making situation, I would think. Uh, to have both these events occur simultaneously, meet the guy and get the ticket, you know, oh dear, <laughs> how to manage that, how to, how to explore all of that and do it pretty quickly, you know. She doesn't, she doesn't tell anybody. She has one, she has a group of friends that we hear about. We don't get to know them too well, but uh, one of her closest friends is this, uh, a man and uh, she, they meet for lunch frequently. Uh, he's the only person I think, I think that she tells about this and she warns him not to tell anybody else. And later on, she tells her brother, um, let's see, oh, the boy. Yeah, the, the boy, well, you didn't want to really be, I won't say what you don't want to say, but I do want to mention that uh, in the past, Ellen has, she's been lonely the past for, for a long time. She had a marriage, which lasted, I don't know, maybe 10 years, or mm -hmm. too long, 10 years. And it broke up. Uh, one of the reasons it broke up was it, the issue of her having children. She is firmly committed. She, she doesn't, well, she, firmly committed as being too strong. She doesn't want children. She's a woman who just never was interested and she doesn't want them. And the man she's married to does. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't continue together. Uh, so when this boy comes along, in addition to the money, it's waiting there to change her life and her whole concept of who she is, there is this child and what will she do about him? Which I must say, you rather, you leave, you leave it kind of a little bit open, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to tie any of this up, but I, 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 talking about the ending is difficult because there's a lot that I, you know, that yeah. happens sort of in, in the last, very last portion of the book that would be kind of spoiler spoiler alert territory. Um, but I, I knew that I, I particularly enjoy novels that have open endings and particularly don't enjoy ones where things are tied up too neatly with the bow. And, and so I, you know, I, I felt that it was true to her sort of self-exploration, self-searching that this would be sort of an in-process kind of situation. Um, and so I, I, I let the book kind of open out that way. Um, uh, I, I, needed it, I needed it to transpire that way. Uh, I like that about it too, that it wasn't, it wasn't all tied up neatly, yeah. although we can all fantasize about what will happen to her in the future. Um, well, to ask you, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is not a literary question, but, uh, the other character, the other woman character, uh, Blair, who makes her art in the subway. Mm -hmm. uh, I was amazed, Martha, that uh, your knowledge, not only of the subways, many of us do know the subways quite well, and, but of the infra infrastructure, is that what you call it, of the subways? This young woman is climbing rafters and finding little holes, and she's just all over the subways, places that we have never, we subway riders have never seen. Uh, may I ask you how you researched that part of the book? Well, not perhaps with uh, enough rigor to satisfy an MTA employee, you know, who might be kind of aghast at, at, what, at what I, an MTA person might say, well, that's a bit fantastical. You couldn't possibly do what that artist claims to be doing. I mean, some of it is painting on the, on the beams of um, the mezzanine at the Seventh Avenue station in Park Slope, a station I know very well. And I did hang out there and look up and sort of see 
could that happen technically? And then there's a there's a tunnel that goes from the Fourth Avenue to the Seventh Avenue stations. And I I did I did walk around a bit in Brooklyn and see would it be possible to shimmy up there and would it you know could one do what this character does? And I decided yeah, it's credible enough. Uh, again, apologies to the MTA, and I'm not advocating that any readers out there do that, but. Um, I, I think it's credible enough that this artist could do this. And I looked a bit into the history of street art, um, but I didn't want to freak myself out by needing to be an expert on that any more than I wanted to be an expert on Camus. In fact, what I thought was this was an alienated but very intelligent and very disturbed young woman who would have, as I said, this sort of magpie approach to these to these um, activities of her own mental and artistic and who, who would be dismissive or disdainful of a certain kind of sustained study or, or um, serving as an acolyte say to you know, an artist or art movement, very, very independent, very much wanting to do it on her own, very committed to this notion of invisibility as a, as a force, as a power that to be overlooked is to gain a kind of power. So turning on her its head, her actual existential situation, which is one of, of real erasure within her family and of, of deepest alienation and, and distress. So she's finding a way to kind of cope with that um, mm -hmm. by doing her art the way she does it. Well, my favorite, her motive, she says somewhere in the beginning is that people need to be awakened that we're all, we don't, we don't know what's going on around us. It's, she means politically, socially, culturally. Uh, and my favorite, of, although her, her messages are brief, uh, my favorite message, which she put on in such a way that you, I think you, maybe I'm mistaken. You see it, it do you remember, or who would remember these old Burma shade signs where you see one word at a time of a, of a sentence that says something. And her, the sentence you see as you're riding on the subway, then you look up, I don't ask me how, and you see the phrase, uh, you're being taken for a ride. And I just love that. And it's, it, it's so much Martha and her, the, the truth and the wisdom and the wit that goes along with it. Uh, that, but she, Martha does not have the, or to me was some sadistic characters. <laughs> character. um, so let me ask you if we still have time. Um, this is your third novel, and I have had the pleasure of reading the other two. Uh, unlike most writers, you're, they're all so different. Um, well, you can, you can tell us what they are. I won't do that for you, but how do you manage to have such a, a broad vision, not only vision, but, but stylistically? It's, it's really impressive that you've done three novels that if I had been told they were by three different writers, I would have believed it, but it's all you. Well, gosh, I mean, that may have something to do with the number of years between <laughs> my productions. Um, I'm trying to put a positive spin on what has sometimes been for me personally, a rather crazy making situation. This book took a long time for me to write, well over a decade. So if there are any writers out there in viewer land, you know, I got your back here. I know it can take a long time. And, but I think that that, um, it, it, it gave it, I finally reached a certain point where it was like, well, whatever, then I, I sort of gave myself permission to go on whatever adventure I needed to go on with this. Some of which involved a lot of shame at it taking so long, blah, blah, blah but some of which just meant that I could sort of try things out. This, for instance, this is a dual point of view, but not a first person novel. I, I wanted to write a close third person narrative with two point of view characters. So that was an adventure stylistically that I wanted to take myself on. And I thought, okay, this is a poet. So the language needed to be limber in a, in a certain kind of way. Um, needed to loosen up in a certain kind of way, given the nature of Ellen, this character and her and her existential situation. I just pictured her thinking with certain rhythms and cadences. Um, mm -hmm. And that was fun. It, it just that sustained me uh, when, you know, when I had when real life interrupted or I just couldn't figure out a plot, a matter of plot. This is a rather 
in terms of plot, it's a rather intricate thing. And so um, sometimes when I got myself a little stuck, at least I felt like I had a voice. I had the voice of each of these characters down. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just um, just finding the the uh, committing to the adventure and the unknownness of it, and just kind of going with that. You know, being being playful, I guess. Um, well, there there is an element of playfulness, and that relates to what I was going to ask. The, um, I don't think you did this in your other two, but I could be mistaken. It's been years since I've read them. Uh, it's written in more or less short takes. There are um, there are sections that's divided up, but sometimes you've got a just a page and a half, and then a little asterisk, and you've got another page and a half, or even shorter or longer, depending on what is necessary. And that that actually there's, there's a playfulness to that to say to the reader. Um, well, here's something, here's a little tidbit, but we're not gonna stay, this, stay with this too long. We're jumping off to the next. Uh, did that choice of allowing yourself to jump around in short bites, so to speak, did that help move it along or help you when you took so long to write it? It did, it did. I mean, I was, I, I was conscious that, you know, one controls time that way. And, you know, I was thinking a lot about composition, about musical composition, about, poetry composition, poet, poetic composition as I wrote, and about visual composition. And, and I realized that, you know, something I've known my whole life, but that I wanted, my whole life as a writer, that I wanted to be just very mindful of the kind of work that white space does in a text, that, huh. that just breaking and, and then starting something new and breaking, what those kind of rhythmic shifts do. There's a, there's a cadence that, uh, you know, I think, I think books, if they're well written, teach you how to read them and get, you know give you a kind of uh, subtle rhythmic instruction, you know, in in pacing and kind of what you can expect and why certain characters quicken things, certain characters slow things, certain kinds of activities quicken and slow. But I'm I'm very much interested in this in this working with rhythm and well lynn i'm talking to a master i mean time out here truth telling lynn's latest book of stories is just pure wizardry and it too has shorter longer um you know the, the playing with with time and the slyness of formal slyness of the stories you know i i spent a lot of time when i wasn't writing reading <laughs> lynn and others and and just um you know, learning to be, to trust myself, to absorb and be more playful with these, with these questions. The, the first two books were not written in this, in this way with as much white space. Yeah. 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 I used to think uh, not too well of what they call flash fiction. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of over before you finish it. Uh, but then I found myself writing short things and it was it was enough. I still there's I, you know it could go on and on, but but it's it's enough. And there was one piece in there that in the book my book you mentioned that was very short. It was three quarters of a page, and the editor said um, maybe you could add a little bit to this. I thought well maybe. I mean it wasn't you know nothing is really written in stone, and I feel everything is very pliable and flexible. So then it turned out to be about six pages, certainly not long, but. It had much more happening, and I liked it better. I might have made it. This is something to try, you know. Try it in a two-page version. Try it in a four-page version. And often, when I get ideas, uh, I could tell uh, how long the story would be. I mean, this, this is a story worth ten pages. Any more, not worth any more. Or this is a story. This is a good one to be worth maybe twenty-five, but don't go beyond that. So the sense of how long stories or pieces of stories should be, and, and Martha does in the book is pack some some very intense moments. Most of the moments are intense, very intense moments into a very very short space, and leave you to kind of leave you. Is is that it? And then you have to reconsider what just happened in these two or three pages. Yeah, I, I mean, I I. I what comes to mind thinking about this and listening to you, Lynn, is that, you know, the old sort of cliche of, well, this is a two beer story, um, you know, and, and I think we human storytellers um, 
you know, fall into sort of two basic camps. There's your really chatty uncle at Thanksgiving who has to give you every detail and the story is lost in detail. And then there's, you know, your quick witty cousin who delivers it in, you know, three sentences. And, and you know, just sort of learning to listen to and observe these different modes and figuring out when details, when elaborations, when sort of, yeah, when development is needed and when it isn't, that, that's one of the great, the great challenges and, and the great pleasures, you know. Um, and making a novel is, Alice Madison, our colleague and friend at Bennington would talk about dragging an elephant in a, in a sack behind you, that that's what writing a novel is. She and I used to talk about, how's your elephant, you know? And it can feel that way. Um, so part of my challenge with this book was to, was to lighten the sack. Um, yeah. In, in whatever ways I could. <laughs> did you did you know when it was over? Or did you? I did. You, did I did. Once I got the ending that I got to, which I won't talk about. Spoiler alert. Um, I did. I knew. Okay. Now, now, I, now it's done. Now I can stop. Yeah. And did you write it straight, straight through, or or? Uh, no, I, I had to do several failed endings to get to this one. Um, I did write straight through, but then I, I wasn't happy with the ending until I was. <laughs> that's all I, that's all I know. I don't even, I can't even account for it, but when it happened, it was like, yes. Okay. Yes. So um, we have some great questions here from the audience, uh, if I may cut in with those, um, though I could listen to the two of you talk about your craft all night long. Um, but Judith asked, um, I love the complexity of the plot, which is both very well built and also random. I wonder how you revised. Did you draft loose and random and then insert careful puzzle pieces or did you set out the story and then look for places where you could insert the whimsy? Gosh, um, you know, memory is, is a trickster in these matters, so I can't be entirely sure I'm telling the truth as I answer this, but it feels like I... I got the basic thing framed and then just sort of started again, sort of thinking almost musically, looking at beats and sort of saying, I need something from that character here versus that character. And something that was mentioned earlier needs to get picked up over here. And I was looking for places of tension where tension would escalate. So that was when I would need to insert something not necessarily whimsical, but um, something that would keep the forward motion going, not be too dilatory, not take me to, you know, uh, if, if Alice Madison's fear is of the elephant in the sack, then I also think about Henry James with a loose baggy monster, you know, that's what he called the novel. And so I, I didn't want that. So a lot of it was just sort of almost like when you, um, you know, when you've, put a spare tire in your car, you know, you tighten the, the lug here and then down here the opposite, you know, you, you, don't, you don't go around this way, otherwise the wheel doesn't set right. You kind of have to ping this side, that side, this side to make it sit right. And that's, that's the kind of work I was doing. Perhaps like a poet who writes a poem, writes into a collection, I need a poem here, no, and then I need another poem here, and then it sort of tightens up, you know? I imagine it like that, non-poet as I am. Very interesting, thank you. Um, Woody has a question that I was sort of ruminating on also. He, he asked, um, sort of talked about the fixation that popular culture has on sudden wealth. And he referenced specifically a television show from the early 60s called The Millionaire. Um, so he and I actually both asked, you know, what things from popular culture, from sort of the popular imagination about sudden wealth influenced your work and thinking? Um, I Gosh, I, that, it's a good question. And yet I, I honestly don't feel like I have too much of an answer. Um, I, I didn't have a TV for, I, I still don't have a TV. I, I haven't watched TV for many years. That, that part is that when Ellen says that, that's actually me. So I kind of missed like, you know, Friends and The Sopranos and all. I mean, I, you know, not that those are money stories, but I kind of missed stuff. Um, I was kind of living under a rock or whatever. So I was just kind of interested in looking around it. I mean, we live in a, in a country of obscene divisions between, you know, great wealth and great poverty. And 
Uh, I didn't have to look that far to see that and to see what great wealth does, the kind of, um, you know, ludicrous and violent stuff that it makes happen in our culture. Um, ludicrous because it, it so needn't be this way and violent because I think that that great wealth does bring with it inevitably a kind of, of social violence and um, so I, I looked around and just sort of saw that going on. And, th and then I read some stories of lottery winners and boy, you know, are they a feckless lot. Um, <laughs> it's a mess out there in lottery winning land. You don't want it to happen to you. And my husband and I have all these inside jokes about, you know, like, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. And I'm, I'm like, can I trust you not to tell anyone if it happens? Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's about all I can say about that, but it's a good question. There was a great article a few years ago that followed, it was in the New York Times and it followed um, MacArthur Genius recipients oh. and what they did with the money and how it affected them compared to lottery winners. And I remember it being very striking. Uh, spoiler, though not a shock to anyone, it, it worked out better for the MacArthur grantees than for the lottery winners. <laughs> Um, Caroline asks a great question. Um, she says, how does receptivity work in your life as a novelist? Often writers talk about the characters telling the writer where they're going, and I get intimidated by such statements, for it's never happened for me. Do your characters instruct you about their lives? Oh gosh, um, I, I think I used to subscribe to that way of thinking a little bit more uh, earlier in my career than I, than I do now. Now I feel like I am, I am their boss. <laughs> uh, I, I don't pay them, but I still am their boss. Um, that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, obviously I'm trying to feel my way into what might be going on. And I'm trying out, you know, I'm sort of have, I'm having them bark up certain trees and seeing what happens when they do. Um, the, 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 the arrival of the boy in the story wasn't immediate, for instance. There was just something gradually that emerged for me as I lived with Ellen and with who I thought she was that made me think, now that's gonna be the kind of sidewinder winder in her life. That's gonna be the unexpected, that's, the, that's another kind of lottery ticket moment for her. Um, and it wasn't that she instructed me, it was just that certain kinds of pressures that I was putting her under led me to think, ah, okay, if that's in the mix, other things start uh, possibly developing differently. Um, so just it's, it's, it's playing around with, with pressure. I think pressure does a lot of the work for me. Just if I put them under pressure, then what? Yeah. Interesting, that's a great way of thinking about it. Um, Brooke asks, Martha, where is your writing style headed in your future work? How do you feel that you will, your style will evolve over time? Gosh, I mean, I have, I have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm, I have a draft of a new novel that is fully set in Italy with Italian as well as um, American characters. And while that's not so much a question of style, it does introduce matters of language, of you know, what is it to be a self in a language? Because we are selves in language. We perform our lives in certain languages, one or more, and who we are in, in one language and who we are in another, as anyone who's bilingual can attest, are not, are not the same thing. So I'm really interested in that and how that will actually play out in terms of style or how it has played out thus far in a first draft. I'm, I'm not the one to say, but I, I'm sure this novel will read differently and feel differently to the reader than than anything I, else I've done. So I'm, I, that's the terrain I find myself in where language itself, um, you know, the speech act and as a as communication and as feeling is is pretty big. So that sounds fascinating. I, I'm eager to, to see it whenever. No pressure. Yeah. Um, uh, we are sadly just about out of time. This has been fascinating, but I do have one last question to wrap things up. Um, I actually lived in Park Slope in 2005, so I know what the neighborhood was like then, and I love the specificity of your writing about the neighborhood. Um, I know the neighborhood has really changed massively in the years since then. Did you find yourself, even though you're a, a Park Slope, at least former resident, having to do research to anchor yourself in time in the neighborhood as you wrote? I, 
had, I was there from, um, really from, <laughs> I, I moved a couple into park, into my, the Park Slope apartment that I'm thinking of in the, in the book a couple days before 9-11. So, and I had been in the neighborhood for a few years before that. And I left in 2015 and came to Queens where I am now, Forest Hills. So I had, I had pretty vivid memories from 9-11 onward, you know, those early years of the first decade of the new millennium um, in Park Slope were, were pretty vivid. So I didn't really feel like I needed to, to check anything out. Um, yeah, what the, what the neighborhood is now is that I can't speak to so well, because it's been, even in five years, things change a lot. There's a lot more money, <laughs> speaking of. Yeah. Yes, I, I was struck with that. I was there also, actually, I moved also to Park Slope um, on September 1st of 2001. And uh, so over those same years and going back now, it feels unrecognizable sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Martha and Lynn, this has truly been a wonderful evening. I have loved hearing you both talk about your work. Um, audience, you can order both Truth Telling and Buy Me Love at Northshire.com. Those links were in the chat earlier and were also in your confirmation email that you got from Eventbrite. Um, thank you, audience, for being here with us. Please come back to future Northshire Live events. We're here many nights of the week hosting great authors and conversation. Um, you can find out more at Northshire.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank, thank you, Rachel. You. And thank you, everyone, for being yeah, here. Thanks for coming. Okay. Have a lovely night, everybody. Yeah.